emerging tech, the framework that we're thinking about these new emerging technologies is potential, pitfalls, and policy. So that's where my questions are going to center today. So I wanted to start by just asking for a show of hands, who knows what XR is? Okay, who has tried virtual reality? Who has tried augmented reality? Okay, so for those of you that have already done this, you understand that XR, or some people call it extended reality, is an umbrella term for augmented virtual mixed reality technologies. And even immersive tech that is coming to the fore or yet to be invented. Uh, Britton talked about the marshmallow. That is totally cool. Um, I also tried smelling of rose and also the dirt and, and the roots that, that uh, the rose was planted in. So we're starting to see these multi-sensory uh, experiences. The next generation of the internet that is always real time, mostly 3D, mostly interactive, mostly social, mostly persistent. And I think that's an interesting use of the word mostly. And I think what that is telling you is that we're still in the early days here. There are immersive experiences like you just talked about. Um, but there are immersive experiences that don't necessarily have to be fully integrated into a social experience. We talked about some of the enterprise applications that you know, you, you, we're creating digital twins where employees can come and work to perfect the design of an automobile. That is an immersive environment. Um, but I think we're, we're on a journey here to this next iteration of the internet and hence the word mostly. Well, um, I'm going to do a little advertising here as well because uh, one of the things that really excites me is the potential for workforce development. Using AR, VR, MR to help individuals get trained and upskilled for jobs that are here today and will be there in the future. And the reason I said a little advertising, there's actually a, a piece of legislation that was introduced just about a week ago. It's called Immersive Technology for the American workforce, and it's focused on uh, rural and underserved communities and how to direct grant dollars in that direction. Um, and Lisa Blunt Rochester from Delaware, uh, and also Tim Wahlberg from Minnesota are the co-sponsors of the legislation. So I, I, that's it on the advertising, but I think the, the potential for this is huge. And I was just at a conference the other day where they had a gentleman who has an auto mechanic training school and they're losing young students. They're, they're just not coming in to, to want to learn this particular trade. And he started to use virtual reality as a training module. All of a sudden, he had young people coming back wanting to learn because it was kind of cool, and it connected them to sort of the digital future that is out there. Um, and he actually told a story about his son uh, who was one of those kids who just wasn't that interested in this. And now, not only is he interested, he's helping to train other students to come into this particular trade and skill. But you see it across the trades, you see it in healthcare, you see it in manufacturing. So I, I could go on and on and on, but I'm gonna let my fellow panelists talk about the many, many opportunities. Um, it makes a great hat now. <laughs> what, um, what I really love about XR technology is the opportunity that it has for evolving human expression and the way that we communicate with each other, especially for neurodiverse populations. Um, you know, I joke about wearing it on my head, but in reality, you know, these headsets are getting smaller and you can imagine what it would be like to wear them to an event like this and have additional context about what's happening in the world around me. And I think that that's going to be really, uh, really powerful in the coming years. Um, it already is, but I think there's a lot of potential that we're still seeing. Um, you know, the way that we interact with embodied and spatial computing allows us to tap into our brain's natural understanding of the world differently. Um, and you, one thing that, you know, I certainly hear a lot about this technology and how it's discussed is as an empathy builder. And I think that this is a, a key component of that. Um, and related, I see XR as being a really powerful tool for raising awareness um, about the really large issues that we're facing in the world today. 
Um, you know, there's especially a large focus right now on how we can raise awareness around climate uh, issues. Um, the United Nations has a metaverse challenge for um, addressing sustainable development goals, and I see um, people all over the world, teenagers, um, professionals, who are building these virtual experiences in order to raise awareness and connect with others globally who are really passionate um, and focused on solving these problems. And I think that given the kind of magnitude of what we're facing, uh, these technologies have a lot of potential to offer us in how we're connecting with each other to solve those problems. Great, thank you both so much. Um, let's go to Lewis. Uh, sure, so I, I talk a lot about the dangers of XR, especially when combined with AI, but, but I think it's important for policymakers to appreciate that, that immersive media, which, which is really what XR is all about, is fundamentally a deeply humanizing technology. And that's often lost because you see people wearing headsets and it doesn't necessarily look that human at all, but, but to be really clear, our brains evolve to explore and understand our worlds spatially. It's how we build understanding uh, by, by exploring and testing our environment. It's how we build our memories spatially. It's how we build relationships face-to-face -face with empathy. Um, it's, it's how we build mental models of our world. And so XR makes computing more natural. Uh, that's gonna help teaching and learning. It's gonna help science and engineering. It's gonna help human relationships uh, over the internet. Uh, but because it's so powerful, it, it has to also be safe. And that's uh, one of uh, the really important issues. In terms of like very specific applications that, that I'm personally most excited about, um, Something that, that I've been involved in really from, you know, for over 30 years is the use of augmented reality in medicine. Uh, it's finally now getting to the point where it's being deployed. And um, the, the really exciting thing is that uh, augmented reality headsets basically give doctors x-ray vision. Uh, if, you, if you can take a 3D MRI or, or a 3D CAT scan and spatially register it to, to your patient standing before you, you can literally look into their body and see the, uh, the disease or see the injury exactly where it exists. And, and that's an example of how it makes computing so much more natural. Because the, the traditional way for doctors to do this is to look at a flat screen, look back at the patient, look at a flat screen, look back at the patient, and try to do the mental gymnastics to understand what's happening. XR removes that gymnastics and allows people to see things where they're supposed to be. So uh, it is fundamentally a, a humanizing technology. That's so cool, thank you. Um, Britton. I think for me, the ability to um, incorporate more of our sensory perception into computing environments. At the, at the Stanford lab, we ha we've had a demo of smell vision for quite a while. And I, I kind of laugh when I talk about that. There's been some recent press about this uh, going commercial, but you, you're standing in front of a campfire and you can hear the fire crackle and you can see the colors of the fire and then but, but there's something different when you start to be able to smell charcoal and to smell a sweet roasting marshmallow and it's it's kind of magic that i i'm excited because this is the closest thing to magic that i've ever encountered i related to that i'm really excited about new opportunities for co-presence the, the field of, um, of codec avatars will allow you to really feel like you're interacting with another person in, in tangible 3D ways, even if it's a projection on a screen. And to me, that, um, that's the real future of computing, to, to take our, to take our, our desires and our, our need to communicate with other people and turn it into magic. My main concern is the combination of targeted advertising with the inferred information that you can get about a person from their bodily measurements. The, the reason for this is that you need your you need bodily measurements to calibrate your headset. You need it to get the device to work. And there's a lot you can tell about a person from inferences that you can make from that data. It's not, um, 
I don't think that's well understood by legislators yet, because previously this type of information was accessible only, only in a lab setting, really. And if you combined the, the temptation to try to take old social media monetization models and apply them to new forms of social networking and computing, you, you can see the companies haven't really wanted to make a commitment to saying, we are not going to try to monetize personal data that comes from eye tracking or pupil dilation or your, your um, or how long you look at something or the, the way you indicate that you like something or you pay, you're paying attention to something or that something is your preference without actually saying. To me, this opens up new avenues for we're looking at freedom of expression and human rights and, and um, basically the right to mental privacy um, is, is something that needs to be evolved in conjunction with spatial computing. So that, that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah, thank you. Lewis. Yeah, no, I'm happy to build on that because uh, I, I agree with all those points. Um, to me, the thing that policymakers need to understand about, about virtual and augmented world really is that when you, when a user puts on eyewear um, and enters a platform, they're immersing themselves in a computing environment where a third party can track everything they do. And I mean, I mean everything. Um, and can modify the world around them at their discretion. That, 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 that high level principle should sound really dangerous. Uh, or at least ripe for abuse and misuse. And, and again, these platforms can track everything. They can track where you go, what you do, who you're with, what you look at, how long your gaze lingers, uh, track your pupil dilation, uh, like Britton said. And it's not just going to be in a fully virtual world, but also in augmented world. Walking down the street with augmented reality eyewear, platforms could know what, where you slow down, what store windows you look in, how long you look at different things, uh, they can basically know everything. And if their business model is selling influence, like social media platforms, they will inject targeted content into your world. It's not going to be the flat advertisements on social media. These will be immersive experiences. These will be virtual product placements that are put into virtual worlds or augmented worlds. Uh, you could be walking down the street and pass a parked car in the metaverse, and you might not realize, no, that, that you know, it might look like any other, any other thing in the environment. You might not realize, no, that was placed there for you and only for you. Other people might see something different. It's a targeted advertisement. The car, the model, the color, everything about it is chosen for you. Um, in addition, advertising is not just going to be virtual product placements, but virtual spokespeople. Uh, basically, virtual avatars put into this world that will engage you in conversation. And with the power of generative AI and large language models, this can now be done at scale in highly customized ways where advertisements will be conversational avatars that, that walk up to you and draw you into friendly conversation and gradually introduce promotional content. And, and unless there's regulation, I as a consumer might not even have the right to know the difference between an authentic parked car in a virtual or augmented world or a product placement that was put there for me. Without regulation, I might not have the right to know that an avatar that walks up to me is, is really a generative AI that's engaging me in a promotional conversation. Or maybe I do know that I'm engaging a promotional av or I'm engaging an avatar because in the in in the metaverse, um, businesses will have virtual spokespeople, virtual representatives, and I might go and uh, ask questions uh, about some product or service. And I might just expect an informational answer, and I might not realize that these avatars are then going to gradually persuade me into, uh, into upselling me or, or introducing information that, that I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm, I don't necessarily realize is promotional. So uh, the metaverse creates a, a whole new realm where the boundaries between what's authentic and what's promotional could be blurred unless there's regulations uh, to protect to protect consumers. 
Yeah, and I think even if it is labeled, it could still be very persuasive, right? If you're in this immersive environment, that's really interesting. Absolutely, and especially if it's powered by by AI, uh, where you know these generative AI technologies can now engage us in natural, flowing conversations. Uh, they're not sentient; they're, they they don't have a will of their own, but a third party with a will of their own can give it promotional objectives and can and it can convey very skillfully uh, weaving you into uh, weaving you into a conversation that's that's highly persuasive and and this will be how advertising is done in the metaverse every salesperson knows that the best way to influence someone is not to hand them a brochure which is what social media does social media hands you a brochure in the metaverse the way to the way to influence someone is to is to engage them in conversation, uh, listen to listen to their objections and resistance, and then modify your pitch to overcome those objectives. And that will be done at scale using generative AI, potentially in highly manipulative ways. Thank you. Um, let's go to Liv next. Um, I certainly share the concerns around advertising and the use of personal information that's already been mentioned. Um, I'll add kind of two separate uh, concerns that I have around XR technology today and kind of where it's headed. Um, the first is related to what we've been hearing about advertising, which is the right that someone has to the way that their identity is used um, in these spaces. Uh, I, a personal story that I've had is I had a, an avatar in a virtual world platform that was actually a 3D scan of my body and my face, and I used it, and somebody, I had no idea who this person was, found a way to download the model of that and start walking around in the space as me. And that was a very strange experience. I've never had that experience in real life. I'm not a twin, um, but I could imagine a twin might be more familiar with this type of experience. But it opens up a question about what is the right that one has to their identity in these systems and how um, we balance verifying one's identity with keeping their identity private and safe on these platforms. So I think that's one, one concern that I, I certainly have from that experience um, and kind of understanding what this might look like at scale. Um, the second unrelated to that directly is this technology is not cheap. It's hard to access. It's not, um, uh, it's not easy to be investing in developing the skills to work with this technology unless you have access to capital or access to hardware to be able to build um, with these headsets. And so there's a question of access to who's able to build for the technology right now, and there's also a question of how people are able to access this technology and the benefits that it can provide if they um, aren't already uh, able to go out and purchase a headset, which could be hundreds to thousands of dollars. So I think that's another concern that I have as well about um, the technology and who is able to actually be utilizing it right now. Liz. Okay, well there's a lot there. Um, and I think at the heart of it, what we're talking about is trust and trying to figure out what, do, what does industry and consumer groups and academics and government need to do to help establish trust in this technological platform that we're building. And I think a lot about uh, the things that, that Britton and, and Lewis talked about um, when it comes to data, I think about some of the, the one hand and other hand. Um, so I think about, for example, the fact that eye tracking can help for, for individuals with disabilities and how they can navigate around uh, immersive worlds or elsewhere because of assistive technology. So I think of that and I think of all of the very real and, and significant issues that Britton and Lewis raised and how do we start to think about where we need to regulate and where industry needs to think about um, empowering the user in real ways, <coughs> not just sort of a big, huge, long list of terms and conditions but tools that can actually be used by the consumer to understand what different pieces of data are being used when and what they can do about it. But there's also conversations <coughs> around data minimization, about privacy by design. All of these conversations are underway and they're very important. Uh, they need to be multi-stakeholder. That's something that our organization has tried to do. But there are numerous groups and organizations out there that are sitting at the table today. Um, when it comes to the affordability issue, I absolutely agree, and that's why as we go through this, number one, you were talking about sort of commoditization of, of hardware, 
and that takes time. I mean, I, I remember when a flat screen television was certainly out of my price range, and now you can get a 70 inch for what, 600 bucks or something like that. It's going to take time. How do we create guardrails and opportunities for people to learn about this technology, not just learn about it, but engage with it? The things that, that I think about the most are um, protecting behavioral privacy, protecting emotional privacy, and guaranteeing uh, what I would call uh, experiential authenticity. And, and in each of those, you know, behavioral privacy, um, as, as we mentioned in the last question, these systems by their very nature can track far more information about users than you know, where you click online. Uh, they can track uh, you know, exactly where you are, exactly what you're looking at, exactly what you're doing. And they need that information to create a virtual world around you. What they don't need is to store that information over time. And uh, because when you can store that information over time, it's not just what you're doing, it, it, it starts to create a profile of your behaviors uh, through your whole life. If, if these are augmented reality uh, glasses and you're wearing them throughout your daily life, if you can store that behavioral information, you can create a behavioral model and know exactly what somebody does and, and, and actually use AI to then predict what they're gonna do next. And that's, that's really dangerous and it gets even more dangerous with the emotional data that's collected, a, a lot of these headsets uh, have uh, have cameras that look back at your face uh, to detect your emotions in real time, uh, detect your eye motions in real time. There's good reason for that because if I can detect your emotions and eye, mo and eye motions in real time, I can create an avatar that looks very human and conveys empathy and that's great, but they don't need to store that information over time because if they can store that emotional data over time, now they can create this record, this profile of exactly how you react, how you feel during thousands of interactions during the day. And then they can build the, uh, emotional models that can predict how you will react in response to various stimuli. And that's, that's really dangerous. And, and then finally, in terms of uh, experiential authenticity, advertising will exist in, in the metaverse, uh, and it potentially will exist as product placements as, and virtual uh, spokespeople, but they should look different. Uh, they should look different and sound different so that if I see something that's promotional, I know that it's promotional, and, and I can at least bring healthy skepticism. Uh, and, uh, and we need policy to, to guarantee that. And I might take this one step farther. Um, you know, storing the data is one thing, but I think also just having the data and using it in that moment could be very powerful. You may need limitations on that as well. Absolutely. Um, let's go to Brandon. My uh, my concerns dovetail very well with um, with Dr. Rosenberg's work. I I'm very interested how pre-existing regulations are going to apply to spatial computing related properties. Um, there's, not a, there's not a clean transfer over. For example, if you look at, um, at the AI Act, it already says that you have to identify when a user is interacting with artificial intelligence. I have not seen one XR related company that has figured out how to actually do that in a product facing way. And it doesn't mean it's not out there, but it's something I'm looking for to see and how, how we're going to have indicators of authenticity and how we're going to import pre-existing law to regulate these new spaces. There's still, oh, I'm, a, um, I'm a former prosecutor, so I, I think about how I would, um, how I would prove jurisdiction, how I, how I would determine jurisdiction, how I would look at venue, how I would determine if somebody, um, if, if somebody's harm in the metaverse actually transferred onto the statutes, which normally require physical contact for harassment and other things like that. I think as we are shifting computing paradigm, paradigms, we also need to push legislators to understand that, that the laws need to evolve as well. 
there were two laws that came, um, two proposals that came out in the last two weeks um, centered around the protection of children. And when I read them, uh, one arguably would apply to um, to the metaverse, but its its jurisdiction was so broad that it was anything that connected to the internet. So as as inform, someone who's a former law enforcement person, I'm like, well, that's going to be struck down for overbreath. And then the other one, um, the way that it was worded, I didn't think it actually would apply to social XR platforms because some of it said you needed to, it had jurisdiction over places where you needed to create an account. And if you look at uh, Meta's Horizon Worlds, you don't create an account. They went back and forth so many times that you create a username. And as a lawyer, I would argue that, is, that is different based on the information that you, you give away and the consent that you give to the platform. So people think that you're doing things that are, that are going to help but I'm not sure the application is 100% there yet. Those details really matter. Um, so folks might need to reach out to Britain to, to make sure that we're getting the details right as we're doing this work. Thank you. Um, so let's go to Liv and then Liz, um, the same question about policies. Yeah, you know, I think we've heard the need for strong consumer protection policies with how people are going to be engaging with advertisements. <laughs> I think there's also um, a question here about what the policies will be like in terms of like platform owners liability for user generated content because sometimes you might be um, on a platform where you're actually interacting with something that the platform creator didn't build but that somebody else did or somebody may choose to create a branded t-shirt on their avatar and they're a real person but their user generated content is essentially an advertisement in and of itself so there's questions too about liability and the capabilities that platform holders will be kind of passing along to other users of their system. So I think that there's some um, interesting areas to explore there. Um, I think as well, this, this question about what someone has the rights to in terms of what's um, being expressed about their digital identity and what's going to protect them. There are laws about um, libel and if somebody makes up um, information about you and uses that to harm you, um, what does that look like when it's your, you know, like very unique body movement pattern or your voice, but it looks totally different from you, or it's being used to power a robot or something like that? Does that count as your likeness? Is that like you enough? Um, and I think that there's some interesting policy that can um, be implemented around that based on what we've seen with like, uh, celebrities or, you know, photography is another really interesting parallel here in terms of places where we can draw from existing knowledge, like is it the photographer's uh, photo, do they have the right to how you're represented, or do you have the right to how you're represented? That's still not a very clear question, so I think that there's some interesting uh, policy to be had there as well. Um, so I, I, I think I want to build off of what Britton talked a little bit about. I mean, in general, I think everybody that I work with is in favor of for example, a federal approach to data privacy. I'm sure everybody in this room would probably raise their hand. Um, we also know we have GDPR, and we have DSA, and we have DMA. We have a lot of laws that are out there in international jurisdictions, and I think we're trying to sort through how do these apply to the state of the technology that we have now and into the future. And we want to make sure that we fully understand that and that we educate lawmakers about where we see some of these gaps arising. Um, and that entails educating them about how the technology works, the different use cases which will trigger different laws and regulations. I think of HIPAA, for example, for healthcare applications, um, will be different from you know, GDPR. Um, so I think we, we have a lot of work to do to sort of spade through how the current different legal regimes apply, how we start to get some consistency, but by the same token, it's incumbent upon industry to do the right thing, to start building in you know, privacy by design, by bringing tools to consumers so that they have better understanding and choice. Um, you know, thinking about uh, the different opportunities for Web3 and distributed opportunities for competition. All of those things are being discussed in various fora. I, I was 
really interested to see the G7 communique had a paragraph on immersive technology. And it said, we want to work with OECD. Well, OECD right now is trying to uh, update its privacy framework and it's bringing together industry and civil society and others to do exactly what I just talked about. What's the current state of play? Where are some of the gaps? Where do we think the technology is going to? What's that terrible expression, uh, skate to where the puck is going? Um, there's a lot of work and conversation underway that takes everybody, all of us, you know, sitting down and talking about the different use cases, the pros, the cons, and how we kind of move the conversation forward. I, I mentioned this with one of the challenges related to access to the technology. I think creating systems that can invest in open source technologies that are moving maybe slower than what a company might be able to do if it's just focused on its own product and getting that out the door and getting that to customers, um, I think can go a long way in helping create alternate models to product development. I think that that can be really beneficial for helping promote competitive uh, behaviors. I think. We also already have a framework from you know, the existing internet that we have in terms of how browsers operate and which pieces of that are standardized. It's complicated with spatial computing devices because different devices will have different capabilities. We're still question we're asking similar questions to what we've had with browsers. There's a really great um, example of how challenging it would be and what goes into simulating just rolling like a pair of dice that I think uh, um, is really key to illustrating the challenges. Um, and part of what needs to happen is it, there needs to be incentives for people to maybe slow down and work together broadly across the ecosystem, across the industry. Um, that's very challenging to counter when we think about how projects are currently being funded and how being first to market and always pushing forward on the technology uh, is more commonly the route people I just want to highlight that point about the browsers and the open web. And I'm thinking about um, in Corey's speech, he was talking about, you know, it feels like there are really just five websites, and it does feel that way. But actually, the open web is there, and that's incredibly valuable, and we should not take that for granted because we might not end up with a similar situation in VR. Uh, go ahead, Liz. Yeah, well, I think the hope is that we will. In other words, that there will be many different immersive spaces that you can come to, try on, experiment with, um, all of those good things. Um, I, I do want to point out that the question of interoperability, I, I, I almost don't like using the word, because when you talk to people, they don't know what interoperability means. What they care about is uh, somebody, who was it earlier, was said, you want to take your sword from this game and you want to transport it over to the other game, right? Um, you want to have your digital assets and be able to take them where you want to go. Um, and then as a developer, as a creator, I want to get paid for what I do. And there will be different models, different approaches to making these aspects of, of interoperability work for all of us. Um, right now there is something called the Metaverse Standards Forum it was started by a group called uh, the Kronos Group and OpenXR, and they're working with all the different uh, technical standards development organizations, SDOs, to try to organize the conversations around where these different technical specs need to go. It's pretty complicated. It's, you think it's easy to take the sword and put it over here, but it's actually quite a, a difficult feat. There are minds that are a lot smarter than I am that are working on these types of exercises. Um, the IEEE is working on this, WC3 is working on this. So there's, there's many different standards development organizations that are trying to make this interoperability conversation a reality. And then how do we then layer on the conversation around policy? Um, and I think, you know, one, we have to sort of see where the technical piece takes us, but we also need to keep our eye on what we're just trying to accomplish, which is taking your digital assets where you want to go, um, Having your digital identity uh, be seamless, uh, but that can create a lot of opportunities and challenges as well. I think about people who want to try on a new identity, uh, so the LGBTQ community, somebody may want to try on a, an identity that they don't feel safe about in the real world. Um, that requires a level of anonymity 
how does that work when we're talking about interoperability? So I'm raising all of these things as almost like an issue spot. And these are the conversations that are taking place uh, across many different forums. Uh, World Economic Forum also has one. Uh, we launched something called the Future of XR Advisory Council to have these conversations. I know ITIF, others are trying to bring together all these different minds to see what we can do. Great. Um, and let's go to Britain online. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to um, go off of, of what Liz just said. Um, the, the challenge that I see is that interoperability, I think when you talk to legal and policy people and you talk about interoperability, they don't think about it as an engineering problem. They don't think about it like the sword moving from one world to another. A lot of people seem to be flummoxed and upset about the lack of governance standards that go across the metaverse. And that's different than interoperability, but we use, I, I think we have some slippage of terms um, because a lot of, you know, a, a lot of legal and policy people, when, when you talk about being able to move from one world to another, the question that comes to mind is who makes the rules? How are the rules enforced? And are the rules going, is there going to be any standardization of rules? Philip Rosedale, who, uh, who's one of the creators of Second Life, said something at a conference on XR that I put on, put on at Stanford that I thought was really, really incisive. And he said that until we work out some of these policy-related issues around identity and authenticity and interoperability and, and things like that, people won't feel comfortable spending money. And I, I, I think that's just a basic truth. So if we want properties in the metaverse to be more competitive, we we need to stop thinking about governance as an afterthought. Because it's not just about people's physical safety, it's not just about their privacy, it's about people feeling comfortable enough to conduct commerce like they would on the um, on the World Wide Web. Yeah, uh, uh, great to build on that point because I also believe that uh, companies are going to compete. Uh, they're going to compete to make money because that's that's how they survive. Um, and I actually think that policy is the most important thing to to enable healthy competition, uh, where where they compete to create the greatest experiences possible in these immersive worlds. Uh, because without without policy, their business models are very likely going to be selling influence, and and without restrictions, they, the competition will be to see who can create the most effective tools for influencing consumers. And again, the capabilities that they will have accessible to them are far greater than the capabilities that are accessible in in social media which is also a competition to see who can make the most persuasive content and, and the most persuasive uh, targeting mechanisms. And I, I often think about, you know, in this world, the word of healthy competition, I often think about social media because it wasn't regulated. Targeted advertising wasn't regulated in a timely fashion. And so these companies became uh, very successful in an arms race to see who can be most successful at targeting, but they've also uh, created this impression among the public that is really very negative. You know, the majority of the public thinks that social media companies are damaging society. And, and I don't think that anyone starts a company with that goal. Uh, and, and I think that had policy been put in place in social media earlier, these companies would have competed in a different way. Their business models would have evolved in a different way and they wouldn't have become the most successful machines possible for, for targeting people and selling influence. And that same, uh, that same competition dynamic is gonna exist in the metaverse, but the tools are more dangerous. And, uh, and even if companies know that it doesn't feel right to use somebody's pupil dilation or their blood pressure to, to adjust advertisements in real time, or, or you're talking to a conversational AI and that conversational AI is, is can actually read your emotions because it has access to your pupil dilation and it's adjusting its tactics to optimize influence 
even if those companies don't want to do that, as soon as their competitor does, they're going to be forced to follow suit because it, their business model will be selling persuasion. But policy can change the arms race from you know, things that are potentially damaging to things that are really positive. And, and I think that, I actually think that the XR industry would appreciate if the arms race was who can create the most magical experiences uh, that captivate users and not who can create the most, you know, use these very personal pieces of data to, to, to create the most influential uh, pieces of content that they can sell to, to third parties. It's interesting. I haven't really kind of come across that conversation of redundancies of systems, right, was what you're getting at to a certain extent. Um, obviously, consumer product safety is very important, um, you know, making sure that we don't, uh, that there aren't, um, you know, FTC violations in terms of, you know, advertising for a product that doesn't stand up to what it promises to be. So I guess my short answer is I think that the you know, various consumer protection and, and industry rules that are out there apply just as equally to these immersive experiences as they would to any other digital experience. Try, there we go. Great. I think that I think that's a wonderful question because again, it goes back to kind of the the magic of it all. I know we talk a lot about policy holes and the, and, the, and the potential user harms, but Man, is it fun, and I and I I think that's why I keep coming back to it because it's it's just, it's just magic. Uh, the way that I find out about new um, new developments and programs and opportunities, um, one I go to conferences. So there's the Augmented World Expo that will be happening next week, and that's kind of where everybody in immersive tech comes to the forest. I look at the new technological innovations coming out of the Consumer Electronics Show, which is normally in January uh, in Las Vegas. And I also, um, I follow a lot of people on social media who, who, who talk about, um, about art and other diverse aspects of this. I think if I had an interest in real estate, I would be very interested in some of the, the programming um, Kind of like Liz talked about, where you can actually tour a virtual space or see what a space looks like, um, almost like a virtual tour of a home. There are, are new applications that I saw coming out last week where people were taking the equivalent of, of Google Earth tiles and putting it together and allowing you to make that into a, a head immersive experience. So in, in short, that's um, kind of I guess policy development, tech development, and scuttlebutt on Twitter. <laughs> I was just going to add to that. I'm I'm totally with Britain on this. I get really like I love this kind. Of, I I worked out this morning in virtual reality. So Chris does this because I sometimes end up looking like a mess. But um, that's the thing. There's like all these wonderful opportunities for artists to render these amazing worlds. They're opportunities for musicians to get the spatial audio that is different from what we typically are accustomed to. Um, for you know people that are in various uh, career tracks, whether it's real estate or the auto mechanic that I talked about, um, they're going to go work with a design house to figure out what makes sense uh, for teaching a class. Um, the one thing that I love is, and I was talking about this earlier with somebody, the, the knowledge capture aspect of this. So say I'm, I, I was giving an example, say I'm a plumber and I'm getting older and it's really hard for me to get down on the floor to sweat the pipe and do whatever needs to be done. And there are a lot of young people that could make a really great living in this, but they just need some help. And now because of augmented reality, this pass through, um, I can be there to help that young apprentice actually work the job and not be physically present with them, but emotionally tied to them in terms of what that experience looks like. So um, I just wanted to sort of reiterate there, there are many, many opportunities in immersive technology 
that are bringing together all these different skill sets in a way that I, I, I would imagine have existed for a long time, but it's like the alchemy, right? It gets kind of exciting. And I would add, um, I think Britain's absolutely right in terms of the conferences that are out there. Um, I would imagine Discord probably has some interesting you know, lines of conversation around uh, immersive technology and opportunities. And then, uh, you know, if you care to, we do a, a newsletter and you can sign up for it. And it's usually a pretty good summary of a lot of different developments that are taking place, both on the policy side, but on the business <laughs> side as well. And just trying to find those kind of aggregated opportunities to hear about what's happening. One of the things that I really love about working in this space is that it affords a lot of opportunities to develop multidisciplinary skills. So it's not necessarily just engineering or just art, but it starts to bring together components of computer science and components of artificial intelligence as a subset of that, but also 3D art and design and storytelling and being able to imagine these worlds and these experiences and the psychology of how users interact with the space around them. And, communication and how two people might interact with each other or different pieces of the system. And so when I think about what I'm seeing um, in kind of younger education, um, there's some really great companies, KaiXR is one of them, that's educating students like end to end on getting familiar with these 3D technologies and what does it look like to go beyond just experiencing them and like maybe playing games to actually becoming world builders very early on and understanding how they're developing relationships in that and how they're communicating and the impact of that. So when I think about workforce development from that perspective, it's helping people become under, uh, very, very comfortable taking a very holistic approach to the fact that we're multidimensional people, we're multidimensional beings, and we're getting these new technologies that allow us to be more productive and to learn quickly and understand and experience so many different things that um, people can have access to so much more information and different types of experiences to develop um, a really robust skill set. I see a lot of like the rise of the generalist coming up now in the context of these technologies and being able to kind of move across how you build it to how people experience it and what the impact that, that has on them. And I think that that's gonna be really powerful for thinking about this across the whole human experience in the future. Yeah, so Nadine, thanks. But does anyone uh, wanna add to that? Uh, sure, I, I always love to add to that <laughs> conversation. So, um, I, I, you know, a few things come to mind. One is, um, there are really innovative companies out there. Uh, I think of Tailspin, and they've created these modules that you can tailor your training, in this instance, for human resources. Um, you don't have to be a coder in order to create something that is modular, but, but applicable to the workforce that you want to use it for. And I think that we're gonna see a lot more of that, where it's, it's not coding-based, it's sort of experience-based. But to your question about um, you know, how are we preparing young people, I think it's a really important to state right now that you know, the hardware manufacturers all say that, that these headsets um, shouldn't be used by kids who are under uh, 12, 13. Um, the reason for that is that physically, um, they're kind of heavy and bulky, and we also you know, need to, to make that form factor a little bit better, frankly, for young people. Now, the reality is, I suspect a lot of parents say, hey kids, this is really cool, you should try it out. Um, and I think we have to do a lot of work to understand what the impact of the technology is on kids. But in the meantime, again, we need to think of this as a continuum. And we do have tablets. Kids are using uh, AR experiences to try to become more of a digital native in sort of these immersive or augmented experiences. And we need to be looking at what that is, how it's working, how we do that responsibly so that we're creating great educational content, using teachers to you know, really uh, put into any type of app that we're using for educational purposes, that it has to be based in good, um, uh, I'm forgetting the great word that comes up and I'm having a senior moment but that teachers are really contributing to what this content looks like. But the upside is that when you get into that virtual experience, I was at um, South by Southwest, and I think it's Time Magazine has done a virtual experience with Martin Luther King. And if I had been 
you know, in seventh grade, and I had an opportunity to go hang out with Martin Luther King in a virtual world, that would be mind blowing and, and, and so impactful. And I think that gets back to some of the things that Lewis and Britton were talking about. The, the magic of this is that it is just, you know, you can be immersed in historical experiences and it will mean something to you. It won't just be a text.